We're very, very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Mayer to talk about this absolutely fascinating uh, 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 subject uh, this evening. As we heard Professor Mayer himself explain, he has a, a long interest in Turkey. Uh, and his first book is on is called Turks Across Empires, Marketing Muslim Identity in the Russian Ottoman Borderlands. But here he will be mainly talking about his next book, Red Star Over the Black Sea. What a beautiful title. Uh, Nazim Hikmet and His Generation, which OUP published this year. So thank you very much for, much for being with us. And the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, David, uh, for that introduction. And thank you to all of you who are here and who have uh, tuned in today. I would like to believe that you're here to see me personally, but I, I realize that all of you, or at least almost all of you, are here because you're interested in Nazim Hikmet. Uh, and that's as it should be, uh, because Nazim Hikmet was, after all, uh, a really fascinating figure. Um, and certainly one of the most important individuals to have ever written in Turkish. Um, but I'll also say this, uh, Nazim Hikmet uh, is not just an interesting literary figure, he's also a really important historical figure, somebody whose life story tells us much more than just the events and developments in one person's life. Um, rather, his, his life story tells us also a lot about the history of the Ottoman Empire in Turkey, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, and international communism uh, in uh, the 20th century. So uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start off uh, by talking about some of the more important uh, developments that took place in Nazim Hikmet's life. And then I'll speak a little bit more specifically uh, about my book and um, what makes it different, uh, in my opinion, uh, at least, uh, from other books that have been written about Nazim Hikmet, because he is very much uh, a figure uh, that's been, been written about a lot before. There are literally hundreds of books about Nazim Hikmet in Turkish, uh, as well as several, many in other languages, uh, two uh, had appeared in English before my book came out. So uh, first I'll talk a bit about his life and then I'll talk a bit more uh, about my book. Um, so uh, Nazim Hikmet was uh, born in 1902 in Salonika uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, of course, Salonika today is in Greece. It's known as Thessaloniki. Um, Nazim came from an interesting mixture of families. So on the one hand, uh, on his mother's side of the family, uh, there were sort of recurring uh, instances of individuals who had come from other countries and made new lives for themselves in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so for example, uh, on Nazim's mother's side, there was uh, a relative called uh, Konstantin Borzhensky. Uh, who had been a Polish nobleman uh, who had fled uh, to the Ottoman Empire in 1848 during a time of attempted revolution in the Austrian Empire. And uh, Konstantin Borzhensky, upon arriving in the Ottoman Empire, uh, converted to Islam. Uh, he changed his name to Mustafa Jalal et Tin and became not only uh, a fairly celebrated military officer in the Ottoman army, uh, but also became a Turkologist, writing a book that was published in 1870 uh, on ancient and modern Turkic civilizations. Um, there was another relative like this also on Nazim Hikmet's mother's side, a fellow named Karl Detroit, who was a Huguenot uh, who had been raised in Brandenburg, uh, born in 1827. Um, at around the time that Carl was about 15 years old, he was working as a cabin boy uh, on a ship that had docked in the harbor in Istanbul. Young Carl apparently liked what he saw. He jumped ship and decided to stay in Istanbul. Uh, he too uh, converted to Islam. Uh, he took on the name uh, Mehmed Ali, and um, the former Carl Detroit as uh, Mehmed Ali uh, went on to become one of the most important uh, Ottoman military generals in the 1860s, 
uh, and 1870s. Um, on Nazim Hikmet's father's side of the family, also we see uh, an illustrious background, also kind of an interesting one in view of Nazim's later life. Um, so on Nazim's father's side of the family, more of a tendency to serve in the civil service of the Ottoman state rather than the military. Um, Nazim Hikmet's father, Hikmet Bey, was a, a fairly high ranking uh, official in the Ottoman foreign ministry. Uh, Nazim's grandfather, uh, Mehmet Nazim Pasha, after whom Nazim Hikmet was named. Uh, Mehmet Nazim Pasha was also a, a fairly high ranking Ottoman official uh, in the 1870s. But one thing that's kind of interesting uh, about Nazim's father's side of the family is not only is there a tradition of state service uh, in the civil ranks, there's also kind of a tradition of getting in trouble with the political authorities. Uh, in the case of Nazim Hikmet's grandfather, uh, Mehmet Nazim, uh, Mehmet Nazim was uh, quite close uh, to an individual named Mitat Pasha. And I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Mitat Pasha, maybe others not so much. Uh, Mitat Pasha was a, a very important Ottoman politician and statesman in the 1870s who ran afoul of uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid II. In 1877, Mitat Pasha was removed from his position and later executed. Nazim's grandfather, who was something of a protege of Mitat Pasha, was not executed, but he was exiled uh, internally uh, within the Ottoman Empire, uh, first to uh, Adana uh, and then to Konya. So, you know, kind of if, if we think a little bit about how Nazim Hikmet's life uh, m later on uh, worked out, um, you see some interesting connections. Uh, or at least precedence in the families of both his mother and his father. In the case of his mother, uh, individuals who'd come from abroad and made new lives for themselves precisely because they were foreigners. Uh, and in the case of his father, uh, a side of the family, a certain tendency to get in trouble uh, with the political authorities. Um, and as, of course, uh, we'll see as we go forward talking about Nazim Hikmet's life. These are both elements uh, very much that would play out uh, later uh, in Nazim Hikmet's life uh, as well. Um, so uh, in 1921, uh, when Nazim Hikmet was 19 years old, he and his best friend, uh, a fellow named Vala Nureddin, uh, set out for Ankara. Um, I'll talk a bit uh, about Vala Nureddin right now. Um, Vala Nureddin, uh, Nazim Hikmet's best friend at this time, um, is a pretty interesting person. He, uh, his life in, in certain ways uh, sort of resembled Nazim Hikmet's own life. Um, Vala Nureddin was also born in Salonika. Uh, Vala Nureddin's family also uh, had a history of being, uh, you know, of working for the Ottoman state. Vala's father uh, had been the provincial governor of Beirut for some time. And Nazim and Vala had first uh, made friends uh, when they were 14 years old. They were both studying at Galatasaray High School at this time. Of course, Galatasaray then and now was one of the most prestigious schools uh, in the country. Uh, at the time that Nazim and Vala were studying there, of course, Galatasaray was uh, in many ways, a training school for future diplomats, future individuals who would go on, like Nazim's father, to work uh, in the foreign ministry. Um, but Naz Vala, Nazim's friend, um, his father died uh, when Vala was uh, 16 years old. Uh, that kind of sent the family into an economic tailspin. Uh, Vala's mother was able to obtain for her son uh, a scholarship to study banking in Vienna, uh, which is where Vala would spend about two and a half years of his adolescence. Uh, when he was 18, Vala returned uh, to Istanbul and got back in touch with his old friend from Galatasaray, Nazim Hikmet. And the, the real bond between these two was, was always poetry. Uh, even when they were 14, going to school together, they would write verse and recite it on their way to and from school. Um, 
And when Bala came back uh, to Istanbul after completing his training in uh, Vienna, uh, the two of them kind of dove right back in to writing poetry. Uh, Vala even sort of borrowed some mother, some money from his mother so he could set up his own poetry journal. And the two of them were quite active in uh, organizing nights where they and others could recite their poetry uh, and publish their poetry. And so this is something that had always connected the two of them. Um, why in January of 1921 did they go to Ankara? Uh, they did so because uh, Istanbul, of course, had been occupied since the end of World War I. Uh, many young women and men were at that point fleeing uh, Istanbul and going to Ankara, uh, which is where Mustafa Kemal, later known as Atatürk, uh, had set up an army and a government uh, in opposition to the terms of the Treaty of Sèvres, which the Sultan uh, had signed. So a lot of young people like Nazim and Bala felt galvanized by these events that were taking place in Ankara and wanted to go and provide support, uh, help in some way to the Ankara cause that Mustafa Kemal uh, was leading uh, at that time. So when Nazim and Vala got to Ankara, um, interestingly, they, they were not sent to the front, uh, despite the fact that both of them were relatively healthy 19-year-old males. Um, instead, they were sent to work as teachers in a, in a small town called Bolu, which is in Anatolia. And at the time, uh, Bolu was under the, the control of the uh, Ankara government of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Um, and uh, they ended up spending uh, about five months uh, in Bolu. Um, they were not terribly interested in it. Uh, they, they, they didn't really find a lot of people in Bolu that they found interesting. Um, there was one person, uh, a fellow named Zia Hilmi, who was a local judge. Uh, that they met after a couple of months in Bolu, and he's somebody who had uh, a lot of influence over them. Um, but uh, one thing that Zia Hilmi, their friend in Bolu, had in common with other quasi-mentors that Nazim and Vala had met during their travels from Istanbul to Ankara and from Ankara to Bolu, one thing that these mentors all had in common was an interest in the Soviet Union. And uh, Zia Hilmi, just like Nazim and Vala, they were not communists at this time when they're in Bolu, uh, but they're very interested in communism. They're aware that this important seeming revolution had occurred in a country right next door to them. And um, Nazim and Vala in particular just wanted to go and kind of check things out. Um, and so after the government in the Republic of Georgia came under uh, Bolshevik control in 1921, Nazim and Vala, along with their older friend, uh, the judge, Zia Hilmi, decided, well, hey, let's, let's go during the, the summer break uh, in school when, when Nazim and Vala won't have to teach. Let's, let's go to uh, the Republic of Georgia and, and just kind of check things out and see what things look like. Um, another reason why Nazim and Vala wanted to go to Georgia at this time is uh, Nazim had recently received a postcard from his girlfriend, uh, originally from Istanbul, but his girlfriend uh, and her older sister and her brother-in-law had also been in Ankara. And that was also one of the reasons why Nazim and Vala had gone to Ankara. Uh, but then more recently, Nazim had received a postcard from his girlfriend, Nusret, saying that they'd all moved to Georgia. So uh, Nazim and Vala thought, well, we'll go to Georgia as well. Uh, and maybe uh, Muhettin Bey, who was the uh, older brother-in-law of Nazim's girlfriend, maybe Muhittin Bey can help us out, give us a place to stay, maybe help us find a job. If not, we'll go down to Kars. Uh, Kars had been part of Russia for the past 40 years, uh, but had been recently included uh, in the treaties concluding World War I uh, between Russia and uh, the Ankara government. Uh, Kars had recently been included in Turkey, and there was a need for Turkish teachers there. So the idea was, 
go to Georgia, check it out. Uh, if possible, try to find a job there. Uh, if not, head down to Kars and they can pick up working as, uh, as teachers there. Um, so they do that, uh, the three of them, uh, they arrive in Georgia. Before getting to the Georgian border, uh, Zia Hilmi drops out. He has a change of heart. He decides he can't cross the border. Uh, he's a civil servant. He needs to stay in Bolu. Uh, so Nazim and Vala enter Georgia on their own. Uh, they're 19 years old. They don't speak any of the local languages. Uh, both of them spoke French. Uh, but they didn't speak Georgian or Russian. Um, they uh they're running out of money quickly as well and when the, by the time they get to tbilisi uh they learned that muhitin bay uh and his wife and nazim's girlfriend they've all gone to moscow they're not in town and nazim and vala don't really know what to do they've practically run out of money um however in tbilisi they meet up with somebody named uh ahmed Javat. Uh, actually, Ahmed Javad Emre would, in 1929 and 1930, become a fairly important person uh, involved in the process of changing Turkey's alphabet from the Arabic script to the Latin script. But that was something that would happen later. Uh, at this time, Ahmed Javad was just some dude hanging out uh, in Georgia working for the Turkish Communist Party. Um, and the Turkish Communist Party at that time was publishing a Turkish language newspaper uh, in Batumi, uh, Georgia. And Ahmed Cevat uh, offered Nazim and Vala uh, jobs working at this newspaper. And he also uh, offered to give them a free place to stay. So uh, given the fact that uh, Nazim and Vala were, were kind of broke and, and not really sure uh, what to do, uh, they, they weren't necessarily communists, uh, when they arrived in Georgia, but the Turkish Communist Party was not only going to give them a job, uh, but was also going to give them a place to live. So sort of times being what they were, they accepted the jobs, uh, and decided, uh, to stay in Georgia for some time in Batumi, uh, working for, uh, this Turkish Communist Party, uh, newspaper. And the two of them, Nazim and Vala, ended up spending uh, about six months uh, in Batumi. It was here that they joined uh, the Turkish Communist Party. But uh, at the beginning of uh, 1922, uh, so their new kind of mentor, this guy Ahmed Cevat, uh, found a job or he received a job offer uh, to teach Turkish at a new university that the Bolsheviks were setting up in Moscow called Communist University for the Toilers of the East. And um, Ahmed Javad had been offered a job teaching Turkish at this university, but the, the people setting up the university in Moscow had also told him, hey, if you know any you know, sort of young Turkish people that would like to study at this university, you should bring them along. And that's exactly what he did. So Ahmed Javad moved up to Moscow in the spring of 1922, and alongside him were Nazim Hikmet, uh, Vala Nureddin, uh, also someone that I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, Shevket Surya, uh, later Idemir, who would go on to become a quite well-known biographer uh, decades later uh, in Turkey, and also Shevket Surya Idemir's wife, Leyman uh, Idemir, uh, was also there. And so these four, alongside uh, Ahmed Javad, uh, made their way up uh, to Moscow in March of uh, 1922. And at that point, Ahmed Javad began teaching at Communist University, and Nazim, Vala, Shevket Surya, and Shevket Surya's wife, uh, Leyman, uh, all four of them began studying uh, at this uh, university. Um, and it was at Communist University where Nazim would go on to spend most of the next six years of his life either studying uh, at this university or later teaching uh, at this uh, university. Um, this time in Moscow in the 1920s was really influential uh, for Nazim Hikmet in a number of ways, especially with respect to his poetic style. So, um, Nazim Hikmet 
one of the arguments that I make kind of throughout uh, this book that I've written is that pretty much everywhere Nazim goes, uh, his literary style, his writing style changes uh, in some way. Um, and I make the argument in my book that every time Nazim crosses a border, um, in some way his writing and especially his poetry uh, changed. Um, and this was certainly the case uh, with respect to Nazim's uh, arrival in Moscow in the 1920s. Uh, Nazim embraced in Moscow the, the style of Russian futurism. Uh, he was very much influenced by the uh, famed uh, futurist poet Vladimir Mayakovsky. Um, this was something that, that really influenced him. But as I argue in my book, pretty much everywhere Nazi went, uh, depending on the circles that he was in at the time, depending on where he was publishing his works, uh, depending on who he was friends with at the time, depending on whether or not he was getting paid. Um, all of these things uh, had a, had factors in sort of shaping Nazim's poetic style and played a big role in why that poetic style changed uh, with every new place uh, that he went to. Um, so uh, in the in the nineteen twenties, Nazim was mostly in Moscow. He spent about six months back in Istanbul uh, in nineteen twenty five. Uh, however, the period that Nazim spent back in Istanbul uh, coincided with a crackdown on politics uh, in Turkey, uh, resulting in the prohibition of uh, all opposition political parties, including the Turkish Communist Party, uh, and all opposition newspapers were banned uh, at this time as well. Um, because Nazim Hikmet was a member of a now illegal political party. Uh, he was sentenced uh, in absentia to 15 years uh, in a Turkish prison. Uh, and so uh, instead of doing that, uh, Nazim, for the second time in four years, uh, fled uh, Istanbul. Uh, the first time he had fled Istanbul was uh, in January of 1921, when he'd fled the British occupation and made his way to Ankara. Uh, now, uh, in 1925, uh, Nazim Hikmet was fleeing Turkish authorities, uh, and he made his way uh, back uh, to Russia uh, at that point, um, and continued living in Russia until in Moscow uh, until the end of 1928. Um, in 1928, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, in 1926, uh, there was an amnesty in Turkey. So uh, from that point forward, uh, Nazim Hikmet no longer needed to fear being thrown in prison upon returning to Turkey. Uh, and so for that reason and others, uh, he decided to return to Turkey uh, at the end of 1928. And so, um, you know, it's with this period, his return uh, to Turkey, or to Istanbul, I should say, that Nazim, you know, it, it sort of begins a period where he's he's seemingly kind of battling with people on, on all sides, with many of these battles initially emerging from Nazim himself, uh, and then later the battles are brought to him. So, you know, kind of the first thing that happens is his old girlfriend, Nuzet, uh, breaks up with him. Um, then, uh, he was expelled from the Turkish Communist Party, which, despite being illegal, continued to exist underground uh, in Turkey. Uh, in 1929, Nazim was uh, expelled from the Turkish Communist Party, uh, allegedly uh, on grounds that he uh, had attempted to set up his own central committee. Um, in any case, I mean, this was a party that had been a big part of Nazim's life since the end of 1921. So, I mean, uh, roughly eight years, uh, he'd been a part of that party. Um, it had been that party that had given him his first job in Batumi. It had been that party that had given him an education in Moscow and also given him a job uh, teaching at Communist University. And so breaking with the party uh, must have been quite a difficult thing. Uh, for him at that time. Also in 1929, 
Nazim Hikmet began publishing a, a series of articles uh, in Istanbul uh, for the journal uh, Resim Liay, which was run by Sabiha uh, uh, Sertel and her husband Zakaria, who are also quite well-known people in Turkish history. Um, Nazim Hikmet began publishing a series of articles called uh, Smashing the Idols. And in each installment of this series, he would take on a different uh, well-known Ottoman poet, uh, usually people who were kind of decades past their primes as writers, and then just mock them mercilessly uh, in these articles. And in doing this, I mean, this was a style that was a lot more common in Moscow in the 1920s than it was in Istanbul in the 1930s when a little bit more deference toward one's elders was uh, expected in the Turkish literary world at this time. And so Nazim really made himself some quite powerful enemies uh, in doing this, and not just poetic enemies, but also political enemies, because at this time in Turkey, um, there was a much more overlap between the cultural elite in Turkey and the political elite in Turkey, much more overlap back in the 1920s and 30s than there is today. Um, and so in making new enemies among writers, uh, Nazim was not only potentially making trouble for himself going forward in the literary world, um, but also in the political world. And so um, from the early 1930s onward, even though Nazim Hikmet was no longer in the Turkish Communist Party, um, he found himself the object increasingly of official harassment uh, in Turkey. He was arrested repeatedly. Um, in 1933 and uh, 1934, uh, Nazim Hikmet uh, served uh, just between 1933 and 34, I should say, uh, Nazim Hikmet served just over a year uh, in prison on largely trumped up charges. And then in 1938, uh, Nazim was convicted of inciting mutiny uh, in both the Navy and the Army in a complete kangaroo court type of atmosphere. And he was sentenced to uh, 28 years and four months uh, in prison. Um, Nazim's sentence was eventually commuted uh, in 1950 uh, after he'd served uh, 12 years uh, of his sentence. Um, but then almost immediately after he was released from prison uh, in 1950, uh, Nazim was notified incredibly that uh, he was being drafted into the Turkish army as a private for a period of two years. And the thinking was, well, Nazim had never done his military service because he had gone to Georgia and Russia uh, during the Turkish War of Liberation, uh, the term that's given to the war that Mustafa Kemal was waging at that time. Um, and so Nazim Hikmet concluded uh, plausibly, I think, that if he were to actually serve two years as a private in the Turkish army, he would probably die. Uh, he was physically not very healthy uh, at this time. And indeed, it was partially because of health reasons that he'd been let out of prison before his sentence had uh, been completed. Or he felt that, you know, maybe he would just be sent to the border with the Soviet Union and shot in the back. Uh, and later they would claim that he was trying to escape or something like that. So it's at this time that that Nazim decided um, that he would try to escape from Turkey. And this is probably the, the best known episode uh, from Nazim Hikmet's life, his escape in uh, June of 1921, 1951 um, from Turkey to the Eastern Bloc. Uh, his brother-in-law piloted a boat um, and uh, uh, took him originally the idea was to go to uh, Bulgaria, which of course was a communist ally of the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, on the way to Bulgaria, they encountered a Romanian cargo ship. 
They stopped at the ship, convinced the crew members to let Nazim get on board, and the Romanian cargo ship took him to Romania, which also, uh, of course, was a Soviet ally at the time. And from there, uh, he made uh, his way uh, to Moscow. And uh, it was in Moscow and Eastern Europe where Nazim uh, would spend uh, the rest of his life uh, until his death in 1963. And it's in Moscow where Nazim Hikmet uh, remains buried uh, to this day. So um, I think I'm going to change uh, gears uh, a little bit. And uh, at this point, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more specifically uh, about my book and uh, how I feel that it differs from some of the other books that have been uh, written about Nazim Hikmet uh, over the years. Um, probably the, the most obvious uh, difference between my book and other books on Nazim uh, is that I, I use uh, a lot of archival sources. So um, most of the existing books, at the time that I was writing this book, most of the, the existing books, or I should say all of the existing books, about Nazim were, were based largely on three types of sources. Uh, Nazim's own writing, uh, the writings and memoirs of Nazim's uh, friends, relatives, and other loved ones, and then other biographies that similarly drew upon these two sets of sources. Um, and so what one thing that kind of interested me in writing this book about Nazim is that um, I have a lot of archival experience working in Istanbul, but also working uh, in Russia and various other parts of the former Soviet Union. And so in addition to knowing modern Turkish and being able to read Ottoman Turkish, um, I, I can also use Russian uh, as a research language. And so this was something that, that kind of gave me certain opportunities to research in certain places uh, where other biographers of Nazim uh, had not. Um, and uh, especially in Moscow, I, I worked in a number of countries, but uh, Moscow especially was, was easily the, the most useful place, um, most valuable place archivally uh, for producing this book. I worked in three archives. Um, one of them, uh, Argaspi, the Russian state archive for socio-political uh, history, was particularly valuable. Um, that's where the archives of the Comintern are located. So lots and lots of information about especially foreign communists uh, who were living in the Soviet Union and like Nazim studying at Communist University of the Toilers of the East uh, in the 1920s. Um, but the, the value of this archive goes all the way up beyond Nazim's death uh, even until the 1980s, which is really where my book ends uh, in the uh, in the epilogue. Um, so in Argos B, like not only is there a file on Nazim Hikmet himself, which is about 300 pages, but also there are dozens and dozens of other personal files of other Turkish communists uh, who lived in the Soviet Union from the 1920s onward. Uh, and so I ended up looking at about 150 uh, personal files uh, in Argos B, in addition to looking at Nazim Hikmet's files. So that was really, really important uh, for both periods of time that Nazim lived uh, in the Soviet Union, both in the 1920s uh, and in the 1950s and 60s. Um, I also worked at a great archive in Moscow called uh, Argalı. Uh, which is the Russian State Archive for Literature and the Arts. Um, this was a great archive, uh, mainly because uh, it holds the papers, uh, Nazim Hikmet's private papers, uh, his personal papers, letters that had been written to him, uh, contracts, uh, other types of official paperwork. Um, uh, in Nazim's life between uh, 1951 and his death in 1963. So for that uh, second period of time uh, of Nazim's life. And um, these papers had never been consulted um, by, by anyone um, working on, on Nazim's life uh, either. So that was, that was also something that I found very valuable. Um, in particular, 
There are about 400 letters from Munavera Andac, who is Nazim Hikmet's fourth wife, who was in Istanbul uh, at this time, uh, letters that she had written to Nazim Hikmet when he was in Moscow. Uh, in the 1950s. So really, really fascinating stuff that I just loved working on. I was I was lucky enough to spend uh, nine months uh, in Moscow uh, during the 2016, 2017 academic year. And then I went back to Moscow uh, for the summer of 2019. And uh, I really loved working in both of those places. And then GARF, the State Archive of the Russian Federation was also really helpful in unpackaging the question of Nazim's citizenship, because his citizenship, he was stripped of his Turkish citizenship in uh, 1951 when he fled Turkey. Uh, and the question didn't become a Soviet uh, citizen until the 1960s. Uh, and so how he handled that question was something uh, that's explored a lot in the paperwork of the State Archive of the Russian Federation. Uh, I also worked at archives uh, in Istanbul, um, the uh, Ottoman archives and the Turkish Republican archives helped a little bit, not so much with Nazim's life in particular, but with some of the more macro context of people crossing borders. Uh, the Ottoman and, and Turkish Republican archives were super helpful. Uh, I worked uh, in the personal archive of Aziz Nassim, uh, who was a writer and humorist uh, in Turkey, uh, who revered Nazim Hikmet and who it appears at some point visited Moscow in the late 60s after Nazim's death and found uh, another uh, 80 letters that had been written by Munavera and Dach that were not in the archive uh, where I researched in Moscow. And uh, Aziz Nassin apparently hand copied uh, these letters and these letters uh, written in the Arabic script by Aziz Nassin are in the Aziz Nassin uh, archive in Chatalja, uh, which is quite uh, interesting as well. Uh, Amsterdam, the International Institute of Social History, uh, has uh, a lot of important papers. It has the papers of the Sertels, uh, for instance, uh, as well as some other archival work that's been scanned that was taken from Argosby in Moscow. That was very helpful. And then I also worked in uh, Washington, DC uh, as well to look at the opinions of American diplomats and policymakers toward Nazim Hikmet, his imprisonment in Turkey uh, and his eventual uh, release. So um, the types of sources that I use are definitely very different in many ways. Um, archival sources are by no means perfect. Uh, indeed, you see all sorts of contradictions within archival sources. Um, good. I, I, I kind of like that um, because I feel like these sources uh, in a very authentic way uh, kind of replicate a lot of the confusion that we see in the moment. Uh, whereas one thing that I'd noticed about most of the biographies that I've read about Nazim Hikmet is they tend to rely upon anecdotes and stories that have been told time and time and time and time again in these biographies to the extent that they begin to sound a little bit rehearsed. So, you know, specifically to see the kind of non-rehearsed element of these archives where yeah, sometimes they'll say that something happened in one date. Sometimes they'll say that something happened on another date. I noticed somebody in the in the uh, chat saying that, well, Nazim Hikmet wasn't expelled in 29. It was actually another year. There are six different years given in the Russian archives for when Nazim Hikmet was expelled from the Turkish Communist Party. So ultimately, you're doing a little bit of research and guesswork and trying to situate whatever it is that you're reading with things that you've seen uh, elsewhere. That's the nature of research. So um, using these archival sources was, was something that was really eye-opening, but just juxtaposing them alongside the sort of traditional sources that are used for discussing Nazim Hikmet, these anecdotes, um, is very, very uh, eye-opening and, and, and quite interesting. Um, but I'd say even more important than the archives I'd used, I, I think the most important, uh, rather than most obvious, the most important um, difference between uh, this book and um, other biographies of Nazim is has to do with the book's approach. 
um, rather than treat Nazim Hikmet in isolation and focus on his uniqueness, I'm more interested in looking at how Nazim Hikmet fit into a certain context. And I think that probably makes sense, uh, given the fact uh, that, that I'm an historian. Uh, probably also has something to do with the types of sources that I use, because I was able to see that many of the Turkish communists that we see going to Russia in the 1920s and like Nazim, studying at communist university, many of these people, people who did not go on to become world famous poets like Nazim, nevertheless, that there were a lot of parallels that I saw between their lives and experiences and the life and experiences of uh, Nazim Hikmet. Because like Nazim Hikmet, and there's a reason why I call this book Nazim Hikmet and his generation. Um, because it wasn't just Nazim Hikmet. There are a lot of people, again, people who don't go on to become famous like Nazim, a lot of people who, like Nazim, uh, were born at the turn of the 20th century, um, came of age in the early 1920s when they got turned on to communism. Um, their background, like Nazim Hikmet, may have been a little bit more uh, nationalist during the Young Turk era and then becomes more internationalist uh, in the 1920s. Like Nazim Hikmet, these other individuals from his generation uh, whose fought personal files I studied and who I write about in this book, like Nazim Hikmet, they too travel to Moscow in the 1920s. And like Nazim Hikmet, they too are valorized and considered valuable uh, by the people in Moscow precisely because they were foreigners, because, precisely because they did cross a border to get to Moscow. They were considered valuable and important. And as was the case with Nazim Hikmet, Many of these people, including most of the people who stay on in the Soviet Union, who don't go back to Turkey, uh, but who stay on in the 1930s, these are people who begin in the third decades of their lives, start finding the doors closing behind them. When all of a sudden in the Soviet Union, it's not such a great thing to be from a different country. Uh, in the 1930s, the purges that took place starting in the mid 1930s and culminating in 1938. And these were, these had just an enormous xenophobic aspect uh, to them with foreigners routinely being targeted merely because they were foreigners. Um, in Turkey, the situation is not nearly as violent or as systematically as oppressive as it was in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, but also in Turkey, individuals who had previously been heralded for the fact that they'd lived abroad or they'd been in Russia, for them too, life becomes uh, increasingly difficult uh, in the 1930s. Uh, the communists uh, are uh, rounded up and arrested in Turkey. And then even anti-communist uh, Russian Muslims who uh, eventually had made their way to Turkey uh, after the collapse of the Russian empire, even anti-communist Muslims uh, begin feeling a political crackdown from the Turkish government, especially at times when the Turkish government is very close uh, to the Soviet Union. Um, so, you know, in a lot of different ways um, during the course of this broader generation's life, we see a lot of parallels between Nazim Hikmet and many others from his generation who similarly traveled uh, to Moscow in the 1920s. And what my book does, the book is mainly about Nazim Hikmet, but I trace not only his life, I trace the lives of many completely unknown figures uh, from his generation and show some of the parallels that continue to exist, to exist uh, for the, the rest of their lives. And so in this respect, you know, my book isn't just about Nazim Hikmet. Um, and indeed, it isn't just about Nazim Hikmet and his generation. Uh, the book is about changing attitudes toward borders and the people who cross them. Um, and um, 
This is something that we see uh, with Nazim. This is something that we see with some of the better known friends of Nazim Hikmet, like Vala Nureddin, who went on to become a journalist, Shevket Surya Aydemir, who went on to become a biography, a biographer, uh, Ahmed Javad Embre, who went on to become an important Turkish official in the 30s uh, and a member of parliament as well. All of these individuals, and then also this much broader uh, uh, collection of individuals uh, from Nazim Hikmet's life. Um, what do the stories of these individuals tell us uh, about the consequences of people all of a sudden deciding as time passes that borders don't need to be open anymore, that we need to close these borders? And so this theme of closing doors, closing doors behind people, this is something that Nazim Hikmet endured, and this is something that many from his generation did uh, as well. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of wrap things up uh, before we go into Q&A by saying that um, the book uh, sort of ends uh, with a discussion of Nazim Hikmet's legacy. Of course, Nazim, from the time of his escape in 1951, uh, up until the early 1990s, uh, Nazim was a quite radioactive figure for many people in Turkey. Leftists liked him very much. Uh, people on the political right uh, did not like him at all. Um, however, with the end of the Cold War, Nazim Hikmet has become a, a much more mainstream figure uh, in Turkey. And indeed, in 2009, a parliament that was dominated by a rightist political party, the, the Justice and Development Party, uh, reversed the decision uh, by the Turkish government in 1951 uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, take away Nazim Hikmet's Turkish citizenship, and in effect in 2009, uh, uh, restoring Nazim's uh, Turkish citizenship. And the fact that that would be done by a fairly far-right uh, government in Turkey in 2009, I think also tells us uh, something about what studying Nazim Hikmet's life uh, can explain to us. Um, in that, you know, sometimes even the biggest divisions, um, you know, those biggest divisions too, those biggest divides in a society, uh, that these are things that can ultimately be healed. And that the fact that Nazim Hikmet uh, was such a controversial figure for so long and is now someone who can be seen on magnets and tote bags and coffee mugs uh, in tourist places all over uh, Turkey, wherever Turkish tourists go, um, I think also tells us something uh, about the power of Nazim Hikmet's legacy. So I'm going to leave it at that and thank you very much for listening. Is anybody there? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for an uh, absolutely fascinating talk. I mean, there are so many ways that one one, one can look at this, and uh, um, I'm sure that there will be um, uh, many questions. Ah, I see straight away Mehmet Ali Dikadem would like to make some points. Uh, um, are, are you still with us? Why don't you just go straight ahead and, and jump in? Um, go, go ahead. Hang on. No, I, I was just clapping him. Basically, yes. I was clapping James Mayer. Well, I, I do have things to say, and you know, and um, yeah, but I'll, I'll say them later. Well, let, let me say, let, let me let me say this. I mean, to me, it's so <laughs> ironic and historically relevant that the Anglo Turkish society is holding a, a conference, a talk on Nazim Hikmet, because as an undergraduate. In September 1969, I got up on my hind legs in the um, uh, Manchester University Turkish Society and had the audacity to read a Nazim Hikmet poem, whereupon I was denounced by one of my fellow students to the um, Turkish Embassy's <laughs> educational counsellor who then uh, promptly removed my status as a student, which meant that I automatically became eligible for national service. So we started in, <laughs> from there, and we're having this meeting tonight 
and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, it, it fills me with joy, and I'm old enough uh, to to live on a few more anecdotes later on if you'll give me the chance. Of course, of course, of course. But 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 I had no idea that um, you were going to say something like that. But but you say in the chat that um, that he was expelled from the party because of factional fights with Hikmet. Yeah, Doctor Hikmet. I mean, look, this, I mean, yes. this, uh, well, the, the first thing is the putlari uh, let, let, Let's let's uh, destroy the, um, uh, the the idols. And that, that was the, the uh, Comintern's class against class struggle when uh, people were denouncing social Democrats <laughs> and uh, all the disasters in, 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 in uh, Germany, etc., uh, can be traced to that kind of ultra leftism of that period. So, I mean, he was writing uh, uh, poems about um, his mother's um, lover, for example, Yaya Kemal. Uh, he was then writing um, uh, kind of very very witty but um, nasty bits of verse uh, about Jakub Kadri Karasmanoglu, the author of Yaban, and, and so on and so on. I mean, it was a kind of free-for-all. It was a kind of combination of um, uh, Shelley and, and, you know, Shelley having a good time having a pop at uh, uh, at his fellow poets and and Epatel uh, le Bourgeoisie, basically. You know, he, was, he, was having a, uh, he was having a go at them. And of course, he was handsome. Uh, you know, he had a large following of of, of um, uh, beautiful women, as well as um, intellectuals. So he was he was a kind of a man about town in Istanbul. Now, uh, the, my anecdotes, if I mean, if, if you'd like it, I mean, my first anecdote is apparently I visited him in Bursa prison when I was in my mother's stomach. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so that was 1949, that must have been. In 1951, my mother's elder sister was still alive, very much alive, 101, 101 going on 102, um, based in, in, in um, uh, Boston, translated the, uh, the first um, uh, English version of Nazim's poems, published by the American fellow traveling masses and mainstream. Uh, um, so that's that's how it starts. So that's uh, 1951. Um, uh, uh, 1961, um, uh, I was introduced to Vaila Nurettin and Muzeher Vanu, who were my father's very good friends. So I kind of grew up uh, in that in environment between 61 and 65. And um, Vala Nurettin gave me Bu Dünya'dan Nazım Geçti. Nazım went through this world with an inscription, which I, I, I'm so excited to, to, to... The book was stolen, by the way, and I know who stole it. But um, its inscription was Mehmet Ali Dikerdeme. So I must have been all of um, 15, 16. Mehmet Ali Dikerdeme, benden 21. yüzyıla selam götürmesi dilekleriyle. Please take my greetings to the 21st century. And I, I think I'm doing that now. He was a wonderful man. He had tremendous amount of emotional intelligence and and, and chelebi, wisdom. But at the time we met them and we were engaging with them, the early 60s, both Muzer Hanum and Valabe were poor. I mean, they were basically living on handouts and, 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 and translations. It was absolutely appalling. To see these wonderful people, so that's the 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 sec, uh, that, that's my kind of second uh, uh, anecdote, and of course, 19, there's 1969 when I was sort of had up and and nearly ended up in the um, Turkish army as a private because I read uh, what I thought was a very lovely and, and patriotic poem by Nasser Hikmet, and so and so on and so forth. So this is this has been my engagement with um, Nazi Ahmed uh, through a kind of a generational, um, because we grew up on, on his um, on, on his poetry. It, 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 it was our ethics uh, which, which followed us around. Thank you for listening. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, well, to I'm, not, I'm not sure if that dog was barking its affirmation. Of, <laughs> uh, but I, this is, 
something that talks about Nazim often kind of bring up. Uh, it, it goes very quickly from his life to personal stories, um, because I, I think Nazim Hikmet more than most writers in Turkey or, or elsewhere. Uh, Nazim Hikmet is someone who, who touches people far beyond the margins of his writing, um, that he's uh, very much somebody who, even if they didn't know him, even if they only knew him from afar, is someone who ultimately brings up a lot of personal memories, it seems, for the, the people uh, that I meet uh, during these talks. Well, thank you for those one, one wonderful insights. I mean, uh, what, why was your mother visiting Nazim, um, though? Uh, my mother was visiting Nazim Hikmet because she was a student in Dil Tarih Geografia Fakultesi, circa 1946 to 49, when you had Behija Boran teaching sociology. Uh, you had Niazi Berkes uh, teaching comparative sociology and, and history. And of course, you had Muzaffar Sharif there uh, as the, the, one of the founders of the, uh, the discipline of uh, social psychology. So she was a student of psychology there. And uh, she was part of the, uh, the, the uh, Progressive Student Alliance or something like that. And uh, this was uh, when uh, Nazim was, uh, I think, uh, in, in Bursa, uh, in, in, in one of his um, uh, one of his fasts. Actually, it was um, you know he was uh, uh, it, it stopped um, it just drinking water. It stopped eating, uh, so it was, uh, to, to be released from jail. And um, uh, a lot of students went to see him, and they were subsequently obviously blacklisted for that. Um, my my mother soon saw the light and 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 and, and changed back and then she spent the rest of her life as an ambassador. So I mean, <laughs> that was that was so I mean in, in a way um uh, you could call me a red what the Americans refer to as red diaper baby. So I'm I'm from the that from that milieu. Uh but uh, it's it's I mean my knowledge, understanding, and affection for Nazim Hikmet was through Vaila Nurettin and Muzehanam, and Nazim Hikmet spent his last night there before his cousin, his very adventurous uh, journalist cousin, who's one of his, his memoirs up there somewhere amongst those books, um, took him to the Bosphorus on a borrowed crisscraft, and the rest is history. Mm. Yes, I was going to ask about that to, to, to our speaker, actually. How, how did Nazim escape from Turkey to, to Russia? Uh, well, as uh, Mehmet Alibe was, was just mentioning, it was, it was actually his brother-in-law. It was uh, his younger uh, sister from his father's uh, second marriage uh, and her husband, uh, who uh, was a, uh, a military uh, officer at the time and also had relatives who were senior rank military officers who apparently knew something about the comings and goings of the Turkish Coast Guard. And uh, this fellow convinced uh, Nazim Hikmet to just make a break for it on, uh, on a motorboat. Um, they borrowed the motorboat uh, from uh, another friend of this brother-in-law who was also in military service at the time. Uh, and uh, like I said, the idea was to get to Bulgaria. Instead, they met a Romanian cargo ship uh, and were taken to Romania uh, instead. Um, what's interesting is when, when Nazim uh, got to Romania and he was asked to prepare a statement uh, for the Soviet authorities explaining how he had escaped, um, he told a completely different story. Uh, he said that he organized everything himself, that he had purchased the motorboat himself uh, with uh, prize money that he had received from the World Peace Council, which was a fellow traveling uh, leftist organization, uh, which had given him uh, its peace prize the, the year before. Uh, you know, he didn't say anything about uh, brother-in-law helping him or 
you know, some other person, you know, lending him a boat. He just said it was all his own work. And I think the reason why he did that was twofold. Uh, I think mainly he didn't want Soviet authorities to learn that two Turkish military officers, Nazim's brother-in-law and the brother-in-law's friend, had helped Nazim escape from Turkey. That would have looked a little bit suspicious, uh, I think. So instead, he came up with this other story saying that he had done everything by himself. Mm. Mm. Uh, I, I, and when he got to Russia, were things easy for him? I mean... Uh... Well, yes and no. So um, he was, you know, it's Nazim Hikmet is often kind of presented as being very naive about the Soviet Union and thinking uh, when he returned in 1951 that it would just be like it was in the good old days of the 20s. Um, my what I saw in the archives does not really support that idea. I, I think Nazim Hikmet had a very clear idea of what he was getting into and realized that his relations with Soviet officials would not always be totally straightforward. And indeed, you know, he's making up stories about how he escaped from Turkey his very first day in the Eastern Bloc. And so when he arrived in Moscow, I mean, Stalin was still alive. Nazim arrived in Moscow uh, at the end of June in 1951. Stalin died in March of 1953. He really kind of keeps his head down. Um, he, even when Nazim was being just relentlessly persecuted in Turkey in the 1930s, he had always been a very productive writer, not only a poet, but also writing novels and serialized them and stuff, often under a pseudonym. Um, in Moscow, when Nazim arrives, for as long as Stalin is alive, Nazim published a grand total of six poems. Um, and most of them written pretty much, you know, in order to be inoffensive. Um, so his, his literary production, or at least the number of publications that he had, went way down. Um, and he was more active in things like international congresses of leftists. Uh, he was asked uh, to take a trip to Bulgaria to uh, help convince Bulgarian Turks uh, to stop trying to leave Bulgaria. Uh, so he gives, delivers all these speeches to Bulgarian Turks who are trying to flee Bulgaria and go to Turkey and telling him that, that, them that you know, life is even worse in Turkey. Um, a lot of people who get into Turkey are being arrested or they're dying and stuff like that. And so he, he really just tried to put himself, I think, at the service uh, of the regime. Um, things, of course, changed uh, after Stalin died. But even then, uh, Nazim Hikmet's relationship with the Soviet Union was uh, a very complicated one. So uh, especially after the so-called secret speech of Nikita Khrushchev in 1956, at which point uh, Khrushchev denounces Stalin and you know all of Stalin's crimes. Um, in many ways, this was something that... Um, was, was kind of difficult for Nazim Hikmet uh, to respond to. Um, Nazim Hikmet was very good, I think, at eloquently explaining problems that were taking place in his own country, Turkey. But I don't think he ever discovered a way or came up with a way of being critically minded in the Soviet Union, where he was a guest. And so uh, when Stalin was alive, I, uh, mainly he, he was keeping his head down and, um, you know, representing the Soviet Union in various writers' conferences on the East. Um, and then after Stalin dies, and, and even more importantly, after Stalin is denounced by Khrushchev, Nazim similarly doesn't really know what to do. His, his main advisor when it came to politics was a fellow named Ismail Bilen, who was a longtime leader of the Turkish Communist Party uh, in the Soviet Union and, and in the Eastern Bloc. And Ismail Bilen was someone who'd been an important figure in the, in the Turkish Communist Party since the late 1920s. 
Um, and that's precisely the sort of person who ended up losing their job uh, after the secret speech. All the old Stalinists started getting forced out of their positions. And um, I think for somebody like Nazim, you know, who had been in Moscow in the late 1920s at the beginning of the transition from the Lenin era to early Stalinism, knowing what he knew about all the bloodshed that had accompanied that succession of power from one leader to another, I mean, why wouldn't he have thought that there was a risk that there could be similarly a bloody succession going from Stalin to Khrushchev? And in most cases, um, whenever there was someone to be followed politically in the Soviet Union, when there was a choice between the Stalinists and the anti-Stalinists, Nazim was usually with the Stalinists because the people that Nazim trusted, like Ismail Bilen, to help him with politics, help him maneuver complicated political world in the Soviet Union, most of them were Stalinists. So at that point, Nazim started spending more and more time in Eastern Europe, usually in the countries that were still controlled by Stalinists, as opposed to the so-called reform communists. So he had he had a complicated life. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that that Nazim Hikmet um, was ever fully embraced uh, by the Soviet Union. It, it was a wary embrace both on Nazim's side and on the side of successive waves of Soviet authorities, first Stalinist, then post-Stalinist. Mm. Yes. So, so you, well, first of all, colleagues, just put your, your um, raise your hand symbolically if you'd like to speak. But but obviously the um, the comparison is with Bertolt Brecht, isn't it? Um, and um, I'm just wondering whether, or a comparison is with Bertolt Brecht. I'm just wondering whether whether Nazim Hikmet had any financial support from these different places. I mean, was he treated like Brecht and given the freedom to be creative? Well, he uh, he earned a good living. Um, and I think that for Nazim in the 1950s and early 60s, uh, when he was living in the Soviet Union again and in the Eastern Bloc, I think what he really liked most of all was the fact that he could publish his work uh, in the Soviet and socialist uh, world. So, I mean, in many ways, uh, he led the Soviet dream. Uh, he had a very nice apartment uh, in a neighborhood where there were a lot of artistic cultural figures uh, near the Sokol uh, metro station in Moscow, if anyone's familiar with Moscow. Um, he had a wonderful dacha uh, outside of uh, uh, Moscow, uh, where again, uh, a lot of uh, important writers uh, were working, including Boris Pasternak, uh, were, were, were living as well. Uh, he was able to travel. Most of his travels took place within the Eastern Bloc, but he also traveled to uh, Sweden. Uh, later on in life, he traveled uh, to, to France and Italy when, when his books started being published uh, in those two countries. So, you know, in, in, in many ways, uh, I think life uh, materially uh, was quite good for him. And I think he also realized that he'd had no choice. He, he had to leave Turkey when he left Turkey because Turkish individuals within the Turkish establishment, whether political or military, um, were making life intolerable for him in Turkey. And he probably would have died if he had done that military service for, for two years. So I don't think he regretted the decision to go to the Soviet Union, but living in the <laughs> Soviet Union was not so straightforward. And um, he always had to be careful uh, about what he was doing. And I think eventually all of those calculations proved to be fairly exhausting. How, how fascinating. Well, um, uh, Mehmet Ali Bey, would you like to say something? I said you put a couple of points in the chat. Why don't you? Um, I, I was in the I was trying to find the. I was trying to find. Um, I was trying to find Rafik Erdogan's account of how he smuggled um, Nazim from the Vanus and and uh, how they went up and they came across the. Um, 
the the Romanian tanker and the Romanians had to ask uh, Moscow before being, uh, allowing Nazi Ikmet to get on board and everything like that. So that's a, um, uh, what what I was saying is that I mean Nazi Ismail Ismail Bilen was 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 notorious. Uh, for 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 being blinkered, he was he was a, he was a star in this apparatchik par excellence, <laughs> and he'd, he'd been outside Turkey for thir- uh, since the nineteen thirties. I mean, I, I've got some of his pamphlets mm-hmm. here, uh, and, and the, the, they're written in the kind of extreme form of uh, pure Turkish, which at a, uh, the at a, at the Turk was peddling in the early nineteen thirties. Uh, incomprehensible, in fact. Mm-hmm. And so, and and he 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 and Nazan had a very f- fractious relationship. And Nazan had to toe the line sometimes. But one thing, I mean, Nazan wrote, and I can't remember it exactly. But I, I, I can't remember. It, but he said, "Ne ne putlara taptum. I I did not worship idols. I Stalin. Ne 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 yıkılan putların altında kaldım. Neither did I." Was I buried by the by the rubble of the idols which are fall? So this is directly di- direct reference to to the fifty six and beyond, actually. So yeah. like Brecht, like Aragon, but especially like Ehrenburg, Ilya Ehrenburg, Nazim had a special relationship because he was good in talking to the um, uh, the respectable face of the Parti Communiste Française, the, the Italian Communist Party, and so on. And up to a point, he did not fight with Bilan. So he accepted Bilan as the theoretician, etc. And he went along with that. So there was a division of labor. So uh, Nazim became the acceptable face of the TKP, which was basically one uh, one uh, unintelligible radio, which uh, started, uh, uh, I think it was in the 70s. But before that, um, you had um, sort of, Moscow Radio and Budapest Radio with, with really kind of thick, badly accented Turkish uh, propaganda coming through. And and uh, they had these, um, yeah, Ismail Bilen's um, little stunts uh, delivering um, uh, leaflets and, and, and the people being locked up uh, for whole, uh, for doing things like that. So th- th- there, was a, there was a balance in, in that sense. But I'll, mm-hmm. I'll also say this about Ismail Bilen. So Ismail Bilen is someone who's been written about quite a bit, yeah. um, usually sort of in these terms. He was the Stalinist and, you know. He's uh, an organization he, man, yeah. Yeah, the, the sort of shadow and Nazim is the light. Um, but uh, Ismail Bilen was also a very uh, interesting and entrepreneurial figure. And he's somebody that I, I devote a lot of time and energy to writing about in this book uh, as well. Um, you know, it's it's difficult to imagine very many other people in the, the communist world in the 20th century to go from the late 1920s to the 1980s, always... Uh, having a position of power and influence within a communist party. Um, most people of Ismail Bilen's background uh, disappeared either in the 30s or they were pushed out of work uh, after the secret speech in 1956. Uh, Ismail Bilen was the leader of the TKP, uh, with some exceptions. There were various times when he was not. But uh, he was a very, very important figure in the Turkish Communist Party from the late 20s all the way up to 1983. And three, it was just, he stepped down from his position in 1983 and three days later he died. Uh, (laughs) You know, and that's that's not very surprising uh, to me because I, the, the party and everything else associated with it, I think meant everything to Ismail Bilen. So he's 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 a complicated and interesting figure. I think more interesting than he's usually given credit for. I, I apologize for interrupting. No, 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 not at all, because I mean, the, the, the two stuff, I mean, has been publishing a lot of things on, on that. But I mean, uh, for example, Dr. Ikmet Kabul-Jumlu wrote 20 volumes of um, some Unreadable, but um, at least original, original stuff. And the, the other general secretaries were quite um, 
good in, in, in analyses and and they, they, they've left behind uh, texts which which give us a kind of a, at least a sociological economic political economic analysis of Turkey at the time in the 50s and the 60s. Bilal, of course, has <laughs> kind of left these uh, unreadable things written in Chartaija, like sort of Central Asian Turkish. Uh, and 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 which which he was he, he survived because he was an excellent factional infighter basically that's what he did and this is what this is what Stalinists do you know they they, they kill you you know in the end basically <laughs> Ismail Bilen also wrote novels of his own uh, and uh, published them in the 1960s and uh, 1970s and uh, you know it's it's interesting to think I mean I I suppose. That the, the easiest answer thinking, well, like, why did Ismail Bilan even like Nazim Hikmat? They're very different sort of people. Ismail Bilan came from the leather jacket background of uh, the Bolsheviks, 1920s. Uh, the fact that he would, I mean, the obvious answer would be he saw Nazim as a, as a good propaganda tool. But I, I wonder if uh, maybe some of Ismail Bilan's interest in Nazim Hikmat also had to do with... Uh, I don't know, perhaps a certain weakness for literature and poetry. Uh, he wrote his own novels later on in life. So, yeah. uh, but a, an interesting figure. Uh, there, there are yeah. certain sections uh, in this book, especially when I get to uh, kind of post-1951 uh, developments where uh, there will be a section on Nazim and then there's a section on Ismail and then another section on Nazim going back and forth because Ismail in the Soviet Union and Nazim and in, in Turkey in the Soviet Union. There are a lot of parallel stories there. That's for sure. Yeah. Don't forget Reshat Fuat Baraner. Sure, sure. Atatürk's, Atatürk's nephew or something. I mean, he's also there as the, kind of the uh, general secretary yeah. of the Turkish Communist Party. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Would any other colleague like to ask me? Think. Go ahead if you would, please. Please don't be shy. I have something to say. Uh, I'm very sorry about the high price of this book. Uh, I was I was I was devastated when when I saw the price. It, it, it's not my choice, but I will say this: uh, a paperback version uh, is uh, by contract supposed to come out uh, within two years of the original book, which came out in March of this year. So, a paperback version is on the way. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I didn't like to, to see how much this thing cost, but, uh, hopefully those who buy the book will consider it worth it. Mm, thank you. Perhaps you could, um, fill us in a little bit about the intriguing subtitle, because, um, you talk about, obviously about Higmeti himself, but you say, and his circle, what does that refer to? Well, and his generation, uh, or, or, yeah. uh, uh, the subtitle of the book, uh, or uh, I, I don't even remember what I was calling this talk. Maybe I, I use the word circle in this talk as well. But uh, for the generation, well, because again, the, the book is about border crossers. It's about people who crossed a border at one early point in their lives and who were influenced for the rest of their lives by those experiences. However, what's different is, you know, in imperial times, border crossing was very common. I mean, there were technological reasons for this. It was very difficult to monitor the border in the 1890s. Um, people didn't have photographs in their passports. People just had photographs. People just had passports that described what they look like. So and so as a black beard doesn't really tell you all that much. Um, but as we get into a post-imperial age in the 1920s and especially in the 1930s, the borders, not just between Turkey and the Soviet Union, but internationally, those borders become a lot tighter. Those borders become a lot more impermeable. And so for people of Nazim's generation who'd grown up with relatively open borders, to find themselves in the 1930s now in trouble due to the fact uh, that they're foreigners or that they're border crossers. Um, that was something that I found uh, really interesting about this. And that is something that I found, you know, tells us something of a bigger story because it's no coincidence that 
as the border is getting more and more tightened between Turkey and the Soviet Union, both of those governments become um, more authoritarian and more violent, not only toward border crossers, but toward their own citizens. So there's a connection, I argue in this book, between closing the borders more stringently for others and how those states behave toward their own populations. So that's why the book is about his generation, not just about one person. Well, thank, thank you. Well, that, that's an extremely help, 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 helpful answer. Now, well, I think I've kind of asked the questions that I would like to ask, but, uh, but uh, would anybody else like to satisfy their curiosity on any on any point? Please do, go ahead if you if you would. Has anybody out there read the book yet? <laughs> no. Well. I hope you can order it. Don't wait two years for the paperback. Ask your library to get it. Um, hopefully you can get it. Uh, it'll be worth your time. And hopefully you'll feel like it's worth the money as well. Uh, but better yet, get your own copy. Ask the library to get a copy too. That way two copies get sold. Even better. But also, if you send a review copy to the uh, uh, um, to the um, uh, the Turkish review, uh, Tidem, what's it called? It, 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 at the moment, the um, the, the Batashi's review. Um, yeah. Uh, um, I'll send the details. Uh, to yeah. James. Um, yeah. 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 We, we can. We can. I'm sure you will be pleased. Turkish we, we, area we Turkish studies review. Uh, review. Turkish area studies. That's, that's on the list of journals that I asked. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. To send a copy to. You. So. Mm -hmm. really okay, that's to great. Yeah. 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 And probably the British um, Journal of Middle Eastern Studies would also review it. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's also on my list. Uh, uh, I'm volunteering to review it. Pardon? I'm volunteering to review it. Great. There we are. There we are. So it could even be a, spe a very long review, um, Chidam, in, in, in the Batash um, uh, Journal. Uh, sure. Because I'm sure that once Mehmet Ali gets going, um, there will be pages and pages. Uh, it'll be a famous review. Sure, I I I I hope uh Mahadari will review it for um our journal. Yeah, that'd be great. It takes five thousand words for me to clear my throat. So <laughs> <laughs> it'd have to be a whole special issue. <laughs> anyway. Oh. I, I didn't I didn't I didn't know that you were a Manchester um Manchester graduate. I've, I've graduated from a lot of places. <laughs> Some I don't care to remember. <laughs> that, that's great. That's fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> Would you like to ask anything, Sheila? I mean, was was not Nazim Hikmet? Um, no, this very is this is, the, you? this is actually the second time I'm listening to James. Uh, mm -hmm. Once I listened to him um, through, um, I don't remember the. Ottoman um, uh, from America, Ottoman studies. Ottoman, yeah. Ottoman and Turkish studies. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that you signed up for more uh, after after hearing the <laughs> Yeah, it's good of you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one. Yeah, just, mm -hmm. just one remark. Mm -hmm. um, I. I am old enough to, of course, to remember how Nazim Hikmet uh, was um, then you that read his books, they were not even on sale. Um, um, I, I did read them through my father's library, um, uh, this, that, and the other. But um, when he became, when he could buy it, I also started thinking and 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 it, it is a fact that um the way he thought and the way he acted it, it sort of became a middle of the road kind of um socialism because things do change in these political movements you know what was once very radical um it no longer was radical <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, so it was interesting to watch that. Um, I mean, to witness that as well. Uh, well, yeah. it's there are today, I think, I, I say in my book that there are two Nazim Hikmet cultural centers in Istanbul. I believe there are actually three now. Uh, there are several all over Turkey. Um, like I said, I mean, I have, uh, I don't have it with me. I should be using it, but you know, the Nazim Hikmet coffee cups and magnets and tote bags and all of these things. He's much more of a mainstream character that it doesn't carry the same sort of political message that wearing a Nazim Hikmet t-shirt in the 60s. But, you know, it, it might be a little bit banal, the the tote bags and, and these sorts of things, but uh, in the course of his life, you know, he's gone from political radioactivity to banality. Um, and maybe that isn't such a bad thing. I mean, the, maybe that's his, uh, <laughs> his love light has always interested me. So that's a different story, <laughs> uh -huh. which I well, was very cool at the time, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, that that fits him actually. It fits his personality. Well, the love life was interesting. I mean, as somebody who moved around a lot and lived in different places, he was in different relationships, and uh, most of the relationships, not all of them, but most of them, ended in some way as a result of the fact that he was living in a different country from the person that he was involved with at a uh, at a particular time but uh i i wrote in uh i wrote an article about this uh it's a little expanded but i i talk about this in the book too of the letters uh from munevera and dutch who is of course a very interesting person in her own right um who's uh, an important translator not only of nazim hikmet but also people like orhan pamuk um and uh Reading Munevar Andach's letters, like I said, there were about 400 of them that I found in one of the archives in Moscow. There are another 80 uh, that can be found in Chitalja, or at least copies of them in Chitalja. Uh, that that was quite interesting. And, and sort of, because Munevar Andach, of course, is a border crosser too. She eventually escaped uh, from Turkey also by boat. Uh, and ended up uh, resettling in the Eastern Bloc in the early 1960s. So very, very, very interesting person uh, in her own right, as were most of the women that Nazim was involved with over the course of his life. Yes, I mean, they, they, stay, they stay married, but one, one wonders whether they're how many times they actually officially got married doesn't one it may have just been courtesy yeah yeah i mean he uh it seems like his union with muna Berandach was more of a civil uh not what's the term that i'm looking for uh not uh, not not officially married uh, i don't think uh in the case of muna Berandach. it looks like with piraye uh piraye's piraye's son uh, mentions a time when they got married and a time when they got divorced. So it, it looks like uh, they were officially married. Uh, Nuzhet uh, and then a Russian woman, uh, those were both marriages in uh, the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union in the 20s and in the early 1930s, it was very easy to get married, but to get married, but they were officially married, uh, even though it just it was something that just required a signature uh, at the time. And then his last wife was Vera, who was a Soviet, uh, Vera Tulyakova, who was a Soviet citizen. And that that was uh, appears to have been a legal marriage. But hey, you move around, you're you're gonna be involved with a variety of people. I, I think that's that's something that happens. Anything else? The dog has been banished. <laughs> so there we are. Well, I've won. I've had an absolutely um, fascinating evening. So, so, so thank, thank you so much. It's, 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 it's wonderful to be able to, to talk about these things from someone who has studied them so fruitfully and so creatively. So we're, we're great. 
it really are in your debt. So thank you so much. It, it's been my pleasure. I, 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 I love talking about this book. I love this book. Uh, I put years of my life uh, into it. And uh, I know it probably isn't perfect, but uh, I, I feel just enormously lucky to have been able to spend uh, seven and a half years uh, researching and writing about the lives of beautiful, interesting people. Um, not only Nazim Hikmet, but among many other people uh, as well. So uh, I was very, very excited when I heard that you would be interested in having me join you all. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that people took time out of their day to listen to this. And we hope we hope that it, of course, that we'll have the great pleasure of seeing you again amongst, amongst these seminars if a, if a topic um, uh, strikes you as being interesting. Um, that would be wonderful. But for now, we simply say, well, good evening from London, and we look forward to the book in paperback. So we look forward to it. All right. Well, farewell from Montana, and I hope to see you all soon. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. Take care, everybody. Take care.